The Civil War, I guess the, to summarize this, the Civil War era, including Reconstruction, reflects what we might call the politics of history, the politics of history. I'm not talking about whether the historian is a Democrat or a Republican or a liberal or a conservative. I'm talking about how and why historical interpretations evolve and um, what this tells us about the study of history itself and how the point of view of the historian affects how history is uh, narrated. Um, and then the political impact in the present of views about history. Certainly, everybody interested in American history at some time or other has to come to terms with the Civil War. No broad theory of American history is tenable that cannot explain the Civil War. What my great uh, uh, PhD supervisor, Richard Hofstadter, in one of his last books, or the progressive historians, he was one of what they call the consensus historians who emphasized fundamental agreement on values throughout American history. Uh, but he said in that book, you know, I, I come, I've come to realize that the Civil War just doesn't fit. And that's a bit of a problem for a general theory of American history. How can you talk about Americans always agreeing on everything when 700,000 of them killed each other over something? What is open to debate in the Civil War? Um, the Civil War challenges many things that we take for granted in talking about America. American exceptionalism. But, you know, a lot of countries have had civil wars, and we are one of them. We're not, we're not as exceptional as sometimes we think. Um, Americans always solving their problems through reasoned debate and compromise. It didn't happen then. Um, and the debate over history, this is a U.S. News and World Report from a few years ago. I guess nothing much was happening that week, but here's, look at the cover. <laughs> Who won the Civil War? This is about historians debating, and what the article is about is how a sort of pro-Southern view of the Civil War long dominated historical writing, even though on the battlefield it didn't quite work out that way. So this is, you know, this is, again, public debate. So the point is, as, as uh, we often say, all history is contemporary history. That's another little adage for you. All history is contemporary history. What that means is, the questions the historian asks are given to him or her by the world they live in. Not the answers. If you get your answers in the present, you're not going to be a very good historian. But getting your questions is just normal. The public, the world you're in throws up issues. That's why the Civil Rights Revolution produced a revolution in the study of history. The feminist, the second wave of feminism in the 1960s produced women's history, which hadn't really been studied before then. Why? Is it because they suddenly found a box of documents and said, uh-oh, there were women back then? No. <laughs> it's that the current world that people lived in made them want to find out about the origins of their own times. People instinctively turn to the past to understand the present. That is uh, the point. Um, and they ask new questions. So today, battle histories keep coming out, histories of regiments, but much Civil War history today is not about, mili it's not military history, it's social history, it's cultural history. It's about the home front, it's about religious life in the Civil War, it's about community studies, uh, how different communities were affected. The old questions, why the Civil War happened, are still out there, but they're supplemented by new ones. O Oscar Wilde, uh, the great British writer once said, the only obligation we have to history is to rewrite it. There's nothing unusual in the fact that, as we will see, that each generation writes history to suit its own needs or debates within the profession and in the public about how history ought to be thought about and taught. This is going on all over the world today. Just a few weeks ago, there was a big article about Japan, where the government is promoting a new series of textbooks, history textbooks, to kind of reinforce a more nationalistic view of Japanese history, uh, to downplay some of the atrocities which the Japanese committed, particularly in China and Korea, 
during World War II, which are seen as undermining nationalist sentiment. Russia is going through the same thing. Putin has announced a revamping of the history curriculum there to emphasize more the greatness of Russian history. It happens in Britain, too, where they have a new history curriculum being put forward to emphasize more the role of kings and great political leaders rather than social history. And there are debates in the U.S. You may remember a few years ago, um, the Texas Board of Education. I'm sure there must be someone here from Texas, and I'm not trying to denigrate your great state. Um, but it is true that the Texas Board of Education did approve. Now, now they certify pre-collegiate textbooks down there, centrally, rather than individual school districts. And this has a tremendous, the publishers have a tremendous incentive to alter their books to conform to the standards set up by the Texas Board of Education. Because the Texas market, obviously, is immense. If you want to think about that, just we went through just a few months ago the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Where was Lee Harvey Oswald when Kennedy was shot? The Texas School Book Depository. They've got a whole skyscraper full of textbooks in Dallas, and that's why publishers have to listen to this. But anyway, the point of this standard is many things, but one of them was to develop a far more positive view of the Confederacy, to downplay the role of slavery, and to just eliminate the Reconstruction era altogether from the teaching of Texas history. So this kind of uh, governmental rewriting of history goes on all over the world, including uh, in our, in our uh, um, own country. And this puts historians in a kind of awkward or interesting position. Um, because remembering history is also going along with forgetting parts of history. The French scholar uh, Ernest Renan, one of my more favorite statements about history, wrote, um, the act of forgetting, I might almost say historical error, plays a significant role in the creation of a nation, and therefore advances in, an, in the field of history are often a threat to the nation. Another way of putting that is the historian is the enemy of the nation, not as a traitor, but because the, the nations are built on mythologies, on a shared kind of vision of history, and then the historian comes along as a killjoy, undermining national mythologies and complicating them. And the era of this course is a case in point. There very, there, nowhere really is the gap so wide between scholarly inquiry and public perceptions of history and public commemorations of history. The way history is presented in museums, in monuments, the kind of history you just encounter just going down the street in this country as in any country. Um, in the past 30 or 40 years, historians have established beyond question the centrality, the absolute centrality of slavery to American development, to American history, and to the Civil War in particular. But in this public realm, there's still a very large void when it comes to slavery. Uh, tours of historic, it's changing a bit, for example, at Monticello, in uh, Jefferson's home in Virginia. They have introduced a lot of material about the slaves who worked there. But many, many plantation homes, historic homes in the South, if you tour them, there's no mention of slavery, not even the word. They talk about servants and what they did. Um, visitors to our nation's capital, Washington, will find a multi-million dollar museum, excellent museum, devoted to the Holocaust funded by taxpayer dollars, as it should be, but almost nothing related to slavery. In fact, in this entire country, there is no museum of, of the history of slavery. And what would we think if the Germans put a big museum of American slavery in Berlin and had nothing about the Holocaust? We'd think they were trying to avoid something. Um, there are monuments across the South to Confederate generals and indeed to leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. To my mind, this may be, that's like putting up a statue of bin Laden somewhere. These Ku Klux Klan guys were t 
murderous terrorists, and yet they have statues to them, but none virtually to, let us say, the black political leaders of Reconstruction, the first African Americans in our history who ever took public office all over the South, but you're not going to find a lot of statues of them in the public memory there.